happen in your life today. give our musicians a good hand and the voices of praise as well. Amen. That's a, if you hadn't noticed, I hope you took notice, that was our little uh, wave at St. Patrick's Day there. You know. I see some of y'all know that saint too, right? Praise the Lord. A little green here, a little green there. Amen. No, I'm not talking about money right now. You know, praise the Lord. I'm just talking about the color, the color of money. How about that? Amen. Amen. Praise God. Uh, just a little aside as a musician to my musician friends that Matt, you, you're carrying on over there, man. I hadn't heard that kind of thing, man, since Stanley. I'll just leave it right there, okay? <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amen. I want you to open your Bibles, please, everyone, in the book of Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. I believe, actually, this, may, this very well may be the last installment on this topic of the power of the spoken word. Amen. You know, I want to start this message off with a question. What did you say this morning when you got up? If you didn't hear me, I'll say it again. What did you say this morning when you got up? Now, I'm not looking for a verbal answer. I, I just threw that out there for you to think about it, all right? What did you say when you got up this morning? Because, see, the truth be told, whatever it is you say in the morning, you ought to say it every morning. But then again, I don't know how your day's been going. Maybe it has something to do with what you say in the morning. Now, you, you, some people get up and say, man, I hate Monday. Now, I don't know, back in the day, things are a little bit different now, but back in the day, you know, they say, man, I can't wait till Friday, because Friday was symbolic of payday, right? All right, but uh, you get up sometimes and say, man, I hate Monday, or you know there's some issues or things you have to deal with coming up on a particular day and say, man, I wish this Wednesday would pass me by. But here's what the Bible says. The Bible says this is the day that the Lord has made. Amen. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. It does not matter what day you say that on. Why? Because every day is the day that the Lord has made. It, listen, the day doesn't depend on the circumstances in the day. Listen to what the psalmist said. The psalmist said, look, I will rejoice. He says, before I even see what this day has for me, I'm already going to rejoice. In other words, I'm going to strengthen myself against whatever the day brings. Because he contained in the word rejoice is the word joy. And Nehemiah 10 says that the joy of the Lord is our strength. So David says, listen, whatever the day has, I'm going to fortify myself with joy through rejoicing. Amen. Another way of thinking about it is praising God, Amen. worshiping God, Amen. giving thanks unto God. Yeah, but pastor, seems like some things going on in my life I'm not really thankful to God for. I, I don't really feel like praising. You see, this is the thing about praise and worship and thanksgiving. It has nothing to do with what you feel. Bible says, enter into his gates with thanksgiving in your heart and enter into his courts with praise. Amen. It just says, do that. You know, don't make, it an, don't make it an elective, I mean, in the sense, or an option. No, no. Do it every day. I, you know, I tell you what, you know, what do they say? You can form a habit in 21 days. Okay, listen, next 21 days, instead of getting up talking about, man, or cursing the day, so to speak. And I don't mean you're using profanity. Right, right. You know what I mean? You know, Man, I hate Monday. Mondays are just bad. Uh, Tuesdays are just as bad. No. Get up in the morning and say, this is the day that the Lord has made. Yeah. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Listen, Amen. make if you want a habit, make that a habit. That's good. You'll be amazed at the change in the course of your life yeah. and the dynamics yeah. of your days yeah. when, you, when you get involved in that. Amen? Amen. All right. Let's go to our text, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3. It's the foundational text for this teaching on the power of the spoken word. Uh, through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. All right? Praise the Lord. 
See, what's important, and the reason why I was telling you all that is, listen, I've, I've been, I'm already off and running, but I want to thank all of you that have tuned into the Facebook live streaming. We welcome you to the Living Addicted broadcast today. I, sometimes I just, you know, I'm on fire, so just burn with me while we go. All right, all right, praise the Lord. <laughs> Amen. So, you have to understand, this is a very important principle of why I'm really dealing with this about you. Because the words you speak, you see, the words you speak, and I'm going to show you the proof of this pudding. I want you to turn over to Mark chapter 11. We've been there before, but I want to underscore, uh, shall I say, one of the principal dynamics of this word from God. Listen, the words you speak are more important to you than to anyone else. Amen. The words you speak are more important to you than to anyone else. Why? Because the words that you speak affect you more than they affect anyone else. Amen. All right? They affect you more than they do anyone else. Now, look at Mark chapter 11, and you notice in verse 23, Jesus says here, or explains how faith works. He says, now, for verily I say to you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart. Now, now watch this next phrase here. But shall believe that those things which he saith, now he or she, this is generic here, all right, which he saith shall come to pass, he or she, I'm just putting that in, shall have whatsoever he saith. Amen. Amen. Now to verse 24, Jesus takes it over into how you apply this principle in prayer. But essentially, 11, 11, 23 explains literally how faith works. And it works with what we say. That's the beginning of it. Because that's what he says, whosoever shall say. Before anything else is revealed, he says, whosoever shall say. So the, the issue always comes back down to what are you saying? Now John 15, 7. Let's, let's look at that. John chapter 15, verse 7. Again, this goes to the point of the things that you say are far more important to you than they are to anyone else. John chapter 15, verse 7, it says this. Jesus said, if you abide in me, and now the word if always implies a condition. If, my mom told me, and it's the biggest word in the dictionary. Amen. After it only has two letters, she said a whole lot hangs on it, though. Amen. If, if, he said, you abide in me, all right, and my words abide in you. You shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. Now, this is, this is awesome in such a short verse. There are two clauses here. Jesus said, if you abide in me, and, in other words, here's something in addition to, connect these two together. You abide in Jesus. Let his words abide in you. Now, what happens when you mix these two ingredients together? What happens when you mix sodium with chlorine? Anybody know? You get table salt. Wow. I know that was anticlimactic, wasn't it? Praise the Lord. But my point is, what happens when you mix abiding in Christ with his words abiding in you? Here's what you get. You shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. How simple is that? Can you see to the enforcement? of these two conditions, of these two, because it is a condition. It says if on the front end of it. So the condition is, hey, can you enforce this? Can you see to it that you're abiding in Christ? And can you see to it that his words are abiding in you? And I'm going to be honest with you, we're all the gatekeepers of our own soul. So essentially, it, 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 the responsibility falls on us to see that these two clauses are fulfilled. Amen. Listen, man, God didn't say give me a down payment. He didn't put you on the 12-month installment plan. He said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you. When, God, when? Now. Amen. Why? Because faith always is now. Amen. You know, faith is, a, faith is an inter interesting thing. Because faith literally defies time and metrics of any, any dynamic, any dimension. I want you to think about that for a minute. You, you can only have faith now. 
You think about that for a minute. You say, well, I had faith yesterday. Yeah, really? Well, I'm going to have faith tomorrow. Really? No. The, the Bible says the only way to define it is in the now. Right. Now, now faith is. Now, somebody discovered in reading the original Greek manuscript from Hebrews 11.1 1, that the word now actually was not in the original text. Don't get bent out of shape over that. So what? Because it, even if you didn't have the word now, it still says faith is. So if something is, when when is it is? Amen. That's good. Right. I could go somewhere with that, but I won't take that journey. <laughs> Amen. So you have to understand what you say, the words you speak, are far more important to you than to anyone else. This is because the words that you speak affect you more than they affect anyone else. Amen? Now, see, a person cursing someone, using God's name in vain, for example, is not going to hurt the other person. They're going to hurt themselves. All right? Because he's actually bringing damnation on himself by speaking such things. Let's look at Proverbs chapter 18. Go there. Proverbs chapter 18. Amen. You notice any more of these days you don't ever hear pages turn? And you can't hear people clicking either, whatever, tapping, all right. <laughs> Proverbs 18, look at verse 7. A fool's mouth is his destruction, and his lips are the snare of his soul. Man, if you, listen, if, if you're not buying into what I'm saying to you, buy into what this is saying to you. Here's what the word says. Here's what the wisest man in all the world, Solomon, King Solomon said. He said, a fool's mouth is his destruction. And his lips are the snare of his soul. Now, that's provided you don't do other instructions that come out of Proverbs. The, the book of Proverbs says we need to put a watch over our mouth. Amen. You know what a watch is? That's a, that's a terminology usually associated with law enforcement because, you know, the rest of us work in shifts. But law enforcement works on watches. First watch, second watch, third watch. And, of course, they may interchange the word shift with watch. But see, putting a watch over your mouth is like put a guard over it. Put a guard over it. Because see, the, the connotation is that if you got somebody securing your property or whatever, you know, they're watching. What are they watching? They're watching for things that might pose a hazard or a problem. They're watching for burglars. They're watching for robbers. They're watching for any enemy that would come and disturb the peace. And somebody that's coming who has a prejudice to good order and discipline. Amen. So put a watch over your mouth. Amen? Amen? Yeah. A fool's mouth is his destruction, and his lips are the snare of his soul. Also, let's go down to verse number 21, which we uh, talked about last week. Death and life, both of them. It's not one or the other. It's one and the other. Amen. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Now, let me stop there and pause a minute. Remember I told you, listen, the power, oh, they start all about. The word doesn't come out of the power. The power comes out of the word. And this underscores it. Death and life are in the power of the what? The tongue. Death and life doesn't occur in this context here until it's spoken. Because that's what we're talking about, the power of the spoken word. You know, you might look at this series as a, a lesson in language. Because really, I'm teaching you about the language of the kingdom of God. I remember, man, taking French, and, you know, the thing is, you know, memorizing the words that corresponded to English words I knew, like words for different food, words for different animals, words for different articles of furniture, so forth and so on. That's one thing to memorize. But, see, one of the things we had to learn was conjugation, Amen. getting subject and verb agreement Amen. in that foreign language. You, look, some of us have been speaking English all of our lives, and we still don't have that part down Yeah. I'll leave it there. Okay. Death, death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. So your, your tongue has the ability to dispense either death and or life. Amen? All right. All right. Now, let's move on here. So the words you speak literally affect your whole being. Now, here's a, here's a, a medical truth. Medical science has discovered what God knew all the time. 
because God's the one that made it. That the part of the brain which controls human speech is connected to every nerve of the body. The part of the brain, all right, which controls human speech is connected to every nerve of the body. And you talk about people getting on your nerves. <laughs> Make sure you're not on them. Amen. Because, see, the words you speak about yourself can even affect your health. Amen. Now, I know that some people may find that as a seemingly extreme concept, but I didn't write this. I didn't write the Bible. The Bible is what says, a merry heart doeth good like a medicine. Amen. Happy people are, are always happy. You know what I'm saying? They're happy. That's, that's the whole point. The Bible says that a merry heart doeth good like a medicine, but a broken spirit dries up the bones. The last thing you need is your bones drying up. There's a substance inside the interior of your bones. It's called marrow. I don't know. I've, look, I've never felt marrow. I don't want to feel marrow. Okay, But I kind of get the impression that marrow is a type of a, a substance that has a flow to it. You know, from the marrow of the bones, the red blood cells are formed from out of the marrow of the bone, okay? And, and I kind of get the impression that marrow is some sort of, maybe a cheesy little substance. I don't know. I'm just, you know. But, but, but I'm just saying, you don't want your bones dried up. That's bad news. Because, see, see, the life of the flesh is in the blood. And if the bones dry up and cannot manufacture or produce more life-giving blood cells, after a while, you can't live. I see why God told Ezekiel, prophesy to these bones. There's one remedy of stopping your bones from drying up. Talk to them. Preach to them, man. Teach them. Prophesy to them. See, you say, well, wait a minute. That's, that's crazy, Pastor. I, I'm not going to just talk to my bones. I, people think I'm crazy. No, you're not crazy. The Apostle Paul underscored this procedure in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 when he said, you know, I keep under my body. Paul was talking about himself as if he was separate folk. Now, he's not. He's the same Paul. But he was saying, listen, I keep under. That is to say, I keep under management, under control, under supervision, my body. My body can have a mind of its own because it has appetites. And the appetites are always wanting something. And there's a time, was it Ecclesiastes? A time under heaven for everything under the sun, right? There's a time to eat. There's a time not to eat. Okay, I'm, you know, I'm sort of paraphrasing here. But in other words, there's a time to give place to the appetite, but there's a time not to give place to the appetite. Can you tell the difference between the two? And can you exercise what you need to exercise to keep them in line? Amen? All this is coming out of the power of the spoken word. So, again, the words you speak about yourself can even affect your health. That's why you, I'm going to be honest with you, man, God dealt with me uh, because I really got down on myself about some things. I know none of you have ever done this, but you know, I just thought I'd share my personal experience with you. Anybody here ever been there? You know, you, 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 know, you get down on yourself. You know, man, why did I do that? That was just stupid. Man, I just feel bad and this and that, that so-and-so said this about, man, I'm just... It's called beating yourself up. Now, I want to tell you something. God really hit me with an interesting perspective about that. He said, why are you beating yourself up? He said, in your civil law, that's called assault. He said, now, if you haul off and threw a right uppercut at somebody's jaw, they would arrest you and charge you with assault and battery. Right. He said, why are you assaulting yourself? Or why are you battering yourself? And on top of that, why are you assaulting my property? Glory. Yeah. That's good. This, this is, listen, this is deep. Because God always sustains this attitude toward you. 
That's why the prophet Jeremiah can say, and I know the thoughts and the plans that I have toward you, says the Lord. In order to do you good, God says, I'm not out to do you evil. This concept, this, this attitude of God toward us is a theme that runs throughout the entire Bible. It runs through the Old Testament as well as the New Testament. Although I realize, looking at the Old Testament, there appear to be many instances and episodes of severity. Amen. Okay? Severity and judgment and this and that. And the but the theme literally carries on. Jesus himself said in Luke 9, 56, Look, the Son of Man, speaking of himself, has not come to destroy men's lives, Amen. but to save them. Amen. Peter writes that God is not willing that any should perish but that all come to repent. So God is always in the business of helping you and helping me to be the best that we can be. The only obstacle that's in his way is our own will. It's our uh, catalog of decisions, if you will, that are the only Im uh, impediment to God's will really being wrought in our lives. Can you say amen? Amen. Amen. So, again, Jesus identifies this fact, this association of our words, even with our own physical health, when he said this, uh, when he said, a man will have whatever he says if he will believe and doubt not in his heart. If he will believe what he says will come to pass. Amen? Amen. Now, this is God's message, not man's message. That's right. All right? And yet, and yet men grab it. In many what you call 12-step programs, of getting people out of addictive situations and whatnot. Now, now you know, I, I'm, I'm saying this, and I'm, I'm, look, I'm speaking from the perspective of teaching you the Bible. This is not intended to be a criticism of any well-meaning people that attempt to help folks get delivered from their addictions. Because, see, listen, when you don't know, when you don't know or embrace the truth of the Scripture, or, or it isn't abiding in you, as Jesus said there in John 15, 7. Remember? He said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you. So listen, there may be those times where it's not as solid in you as you think. And, and so there, thank God there's other human beings that try to help other human beings out of bad situation and circumstance. But see, one thing they say, because I've heard this said about Alcoholics Anonymous, okay? The, the first thing that people do, they come in the group and sit down and say, well, I'm an alcoholic. Amen. I don't think they understand. I don't think they understand the signature of that statement. Amen. See, it leads off with I am. Man, listen to me. I am is you. That's God. When Moses appeared before God in the mount, seeing the bush burning and not being consumed, and God was giving him his next marching orders and Moses said, look, I need a calling card. I can't just go up to Pharaoh and say, here I am. I'm Moses. You know? No, God said, tell him I am has sent you. I am that I am. See, you need to be very considerate. You need to be very careful about what you put after I am. Because I am, to me, is the autograph or the signature of God. Man, you sign it off. I am whatever follows that. Now, you know, that's why, now this is where, you know, we get into trouble sometimes ministering along these lines because the Bible says, listen, the Bible says, let the weak say. Wait a minute. Who did it say to say that? It said, let the weak say, I am strong. It didn't say, let the weak say, I am weak. Come on, somebody. It said, let the weak say, I am strong. Well, but I'd be lying. We're not. No, 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 no. The Bible warns you against lying against the truth. The truth of the word is, let the weak say, I am strong. He's trying to coach you to move away from weakness. That's why any good coach of any athletic team, the greatest job that the coach does is the Oh, man, this, go, this thing, you can't get away from the word. What did, listen, what did John the Baptist preach? What did Jesus preach? When he Repent. That's what Change your mind. Change your thinking. That's what a good coach does. Kids get out there on the, 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 you know, the, the little league baseball or, or even an NFL National League team or whatever. Players are players. You know, when they're out there in the game, man, they're not thinking about a lot of things. And, and when they take a hit, 
or something that good away, you know, immediately it, it can affect their whole person. And if they're not careful, man, they'll start saying stuff to themselves. They'll start saying things to themselves. Man, I'm stupid, man. I, I blew that down, man. I can't, I can't make this happen, man. I can't, I can't get a point. I can't buy a point. You, you, wait a minute. Wait a minute. See, a coach says, come here, guys. All right, come here. Listen, y'all can do this. Say, I can do this. See, that, it, it, it's that simple. They pay those coaches millions of dollars to teach those players how to think and talk. That's basically what it is. I mean, yeah, they're making plays, and they got to construct plays, and there's quite a bit of you know, complexity in that. But essentially, that's what they're really trying to do. They're trying to get those guys to think right and consequently talk right. Because, they, listen, there's a sequential order of events here. See, when your thinking's off, huh? Th then, see, what happens is y y your believing gets off. And consequ consequently, your words go off. It's like an automobile man riding on tires and you keep bumping into speed breakers and whatnot and knocks the front end out of alignment. And so you start getting more wear on the outside of the tires or the inside of the tires. One wears out more quicker than the other. And it becomes a chain reaction of issues. You're always changing tires one at a time. Because, and that's how it is even in your own life. Okay? You, you see, the thing, don't get bumped out of alignment. Align yourself with God's word. See, when they do the align, alignment on a car, they have a device, a machine, man, that, that aims those tires. And there's certain, I'm not going to get into the deep mechanics of it, but, but the point is there's a standard. That's what I'm trying to tell you. There's a standard, and they're trying to get the wheels lined up with that standard. Then they know that those wheels are in alignment. They'll wear evenly, and you get better performance out of them. When you're in alignment with God's word, you perform better. See, you, you, listen, you can knit and weave this word every which way because now, now, what did I tell you about now? Isn't that how faith, faith is on it? Now the just shall live by. That's how, we, that's how we're supposed to live. If you're living any other way, you're in an environment that's hostile. I'm just going to tell you the truth. Skin divers have to carry the environment with them when they go into the water. Because the water is not their regular and normal environment. They cannot breathe water. Fish and aquatic life have been equipped by God with gills. Gills have the ability to draw the oxygen out of the water. We don't have an apparatus that can get oxygen out of the water. The fish do. So we have to carry our apparatus with us. And see, it says the just shall live by faith. When you get out here into the world, which we all must do, okay, because we're working out there in it, we're, we're, we're schooling in it, we're, we're laboring in it, all, all this, and that we're in the world, but we're not of the world. Amen. And see, what you got to do, what you have to remember is to take your environment with you. This is why Joshua 1 and 8 is written. Meditate in the word day and night that you may observe to do according to all that's written therein. Listen, he said, this word shall not depart from your mouth. Oh, glory to God. Amen. This word shall not depart from your mouth. Amen. It's critical. The Bible from stem to stern, man, says, listen, get this word in your mouth. Amen. Turn not to the right hand or to the left hand. Get this word in your mouth. Amen. The word of faith which we preach. Amen. That's what this is telling you. This is what the Bible tells you. This is the power of the spoken word. Can you say amen? amen. So, as I said, th yeah, this is God's method, not, not our method. Listen, what do you do with a scripture like Ephesians 5.1? Be therefore followers of God as dear children. In other words, another translation says imitators. Amen. Mimicking. That's what your children do. Amen. You raise them. Yeah. They do what you do. They sound like you too, okay? But essentially, they do what you do, amen? All right, so we should follow along after God with his method and ways of doing things. Now, when God saw something he didn't agree with, he spoke the thing that is desired. Have you ever wondered why it's impossible for God to lie? God releases sufficient faith in every word that he speaks to cause it to come to pass. 
And some of God's people wonder why Jesus had such great faith. Well, let's let him speak for himself. Let's go to John chapter 12. John's Gospel, chapter 12. Praise the Lord. And uh, let's take a look there around about verse 47. That's where we're going. John 12, 47. Now, here, listen to what Jesus said. Now, I'm going to read this from the Amplified because I really want you to get this, all right? If anyone hears my teachings, now, this, Jesus is saying these things. If anyone hears my teachings and fails to observe them, in other words, does not keep them but disregards them, it is not I who judges him. I wish people would stop saying, God going to get you. <laughs> God is not going to get you. You get yourself. Didn't we just read earlier in the message from Proverbs there in 18th chapter, the 7th verse, about how a fool's mouth, you got to watch out for his mouth. And how his words ensnaring, yeah. right? Okay, so God's not going to get you. You getting yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Jesus goes on. He says, "For I've not come to judge and to condemn and to pass sentence and to inflict penalty on the world, but to save the world." That was Jesus' whole mission. That was his entire mission. He came, to, he said so. He said, I came to seek and to save that which was lost. What was lost? The world. Amen. Humanity. He came to seek and save that which was lost. Now, I'm, I'm not making this up. This is the scripture. Amen. I'm reading it from the Amplified Translation. Okay, read it from King James. That'll say, if any man hear my words and believe not, I judge him not. For I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. All right? He that rejects me and receives not my words has one that judges him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. All right? Now, back over to Amplified. Anyone who rejects me and persistently sets me at naught or at nothing, refusing to accept my teaching, has his judge. However, for the very message that I have spoken, will itself judge and convict him at the last day. See, you cannot alter God's word. It is what it is all the time. It's like God himself. He's the same yesterday and today and forever. He's the Lord. He changes not. There's no variableness in him, neither a shadow of turning. God is the most constant. Can I use the word element in the universe? I don't mean to make him subservient to his own creation, but, I, you know, I'm woefully inadequate to really find words to describe the awesomeness of God. Okay? But, but I'm just trying to tell you, man, God's got it all together. Amen? See, the challenge to us is, the challenge to us is to live up to the level of God's expectation. Too often we're trying to call God down to where we are. But even the Bible warns against that. In Ephesians 4, it says, don't, don't call him down where you are. Come on up higher because he, he's enabled you to do that. Amen. He's enabled you to do that. Amen? Thank you, Lord. And you know what? It, it's funny, man, but living by faith is like a parent trying to get their little ones to take their first step. Uh, you know, I remember specifically, I, I remember all the children, but joy stands out of my mind particularly because it was such an exciting thing where he finally took his first step. And, you know, when he was doing that, you know, he fell a number of times, yeah. as all the kids do, yeah. you know. But, man, one time he got up, that last time, and the next thing you know, poof, poof, putting one foot right in front of the other, walking up right. He was laughing and giggling. Even when he fell, he was laughing and giggling. <laughs> and when he fell, man, you know, my wife and I didn't say, man, this joke ain't going to make it. <laughs> man, forget it. He, he, he's never going to get this, you know what I'm saying? He's, he's, ne he's not going to get this. Uh, we might as well give up. He'll, ne he'll never walk. Man, are you kidding? No, 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 no. We laugh with him, and we encourage him, and we pick him up and let him get started again. And finally, man, he started walking. Uh, amen? amen. We'll, we'll see, this, this is how God deals with us. There's, there's no greater father than God. Amen. When God's telling you, come on and live up to the level of my expectation, amen. you and I are thinking, God, that's not going to happen. We can't deal with that. That's, that's far too great of a standard to, to shoot for. But God says, come on anyway. Come on anyway. Come on. I, 
I'll show you how to do it. Because God has enabled us to do it. Look, that, he enabled us from the very beginning. Amen. You see, it's an interesting thing, but the fall in the garden did not remove the edicts of God from the beginning. See, the Bible said that God blessed them. He did that before they messed up. God released a blessing and said to them, be fruitful and multiply, replenish, subdue, and, and, and have dominion over the earth. And, and see, you know, the fall in the garden created an impediment, but it did not remove the blessing. It did not remove the potential. It did not remove what God spoke into man. And, and when he spoke into the first man, he spoke into all men. He spoke into the entire race of humanity. Oh, you say, well, Pastor, why are we so messed up? Because, man, when the fall took place in the garden, all of humanity fell. And we, we are what, what people call in a fallen state. But Jesus, everybody say Jesus, Jesus. came to seek and to save that which was lost. And he came to remind us that if you abide in him and his words abide in you, then you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. One translation out of the Greek says you will place a demand in the realm of the spirit. You're not, you, you, don't misunderstand. You're not making, casting an ultimatum on God. God, you better do this or else. You know, it doesn't work like that. No, this is supposed to be our everyday doing and dealing. I'm told when an infant is born into the world, you don't have to teach it how to eat. It arrives knowing and goes about it. Mama holds that baby up to her breast. Baby ain't asking for a GPS. Which way? Left, right, front, center. Amen. Funny, you listen, you put that child up there and it knows. Amen. Hadn't been to class, hadn't taken a health class, <laughs> nothing. Amen. I'm only bringing this point up because, see, again, Peter says, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word. That is something we come equipped to do. This, is not, this should not be foreign to us. This should not be an action that's so beyond our capability or understanding. No, no. We are made this way. God ensured that we were made this way. Man, it, it, oh, the Hallelujah. Some about, man, the righteous desiring the word of God, they will be fulfilled, my friend. Amen. 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 And I'm telling you, when you have that desire, as Peter said, as a newborn babe, desiring sincere milk of the word, you're going to get fed. But it's normality for us. That's the way God outfitted all of humanity. But the other thing is, the critical thing is that God also outfitted humanity with a free will to choose and decide because love always has a choice. God doesn't make you love him. He doesn't make you worship him. You understand? He wants you to do that of your own free will. Now the Bible says the only reason we love him is because he first he first loved us. Right. Amen. Ah, hallelujah. So, again, back to John 12. I want to finish this out. Let me start over again from verse 47. If anyone hears my teachings and fails to observe them, does not keep them, but disregards them, it is not I who judges him. For I have not come to judge and to condemn and to pass sentence and to inflict penalty on the world, but to save the world. Anyone who rejects me and persistently sets me at naught, refusing to accept my teachings, has his judge, however. For... The very message that I have spoken will itself judge and convict him at the last day. Why is this? Because heaven and earth will pass away. But God's word will not pass away. Nothing can displace it. The world, listen, the world 
lying out there in chaos, calamity, and confusion, they really don't have to be in that. But as long as they persistently, as Jesus said, turn away from the word, turn away from the truth, refuse to accept and observe his saying, they're always going to be in that situation. Man, that, that, you know, God rest the souls of those that were uh, uh, slaughtered at the time of this message down, down under there in New Zealand. Okay? And, and, and you know, people are going to get all, you know, they get all wound up in this, that, and the other. Listen, listen, let me tell you something. God is not behind that. Okay? You see, Jesus said, it's the thief that cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. See, you've got demonized folk out there. Demonized. You ever heard of ionized? Demonized. Well, wait a minute. I, you know, I was often wondering about that, Pastor. I'm a Christian. Can I be messed up with a spirit? Sure you can. You can have a spirit, but a spirit can't have you. Unless you let it. You see? I got change in my pocket. But the change doesn't have me. You, you, you might have a, an irritant in the form of a demonic influence that's attempting to wreak havoc in your life. But you also have the authority through the name of Jesus to cast the thing out. Okay? You know, it says cast it out. That is to, it, it gives you the, the impression of being a bouncer. You have to be a spiritual bouncer. <laughs> See, you folks that went clubbing back in the day, every club had a bouncer. Because, man, when people got in there drinking that all and what, that, okay, you know, they, they forgot where they were and who they were. But the bouncer reminded them. Yeah. Hmm? That's good. Right. <laughs> The, the, the bouncer enforced good order and discipline, all right? Now, <laughs> and what did he do? He threw you out. He cast you out. I had seen it many times. They just threw the, the revelry, you know, rabble rousers right out on the street. Get out. Don't come back. They didn't try. Listen, they, they might have come. Hey, fellas, y'all getting out of control. And see, if they kept on, they kept on. Man, we ain't out of control, man. We, we, we paid to get it. Man, you out of here. They can't counsel them out. They can't talk them out. The bouncer threw them out. This is the only way you can deal with demonic influences. There is no reasoning with them. There is no rationalizing with them. They have to be cast out. Now, hold on. I got to park here, man. I got to throw a parenthetical footnote in here right quick. We are not wrestling against flesh and blood. Ooh, my goodness. See, some of y'all got this image in your mind. I'm throwing that rascal out of this house. I'm throwing him out of this apartment. I'm a... Now, that, it may come to that. <laughs> you know, it may come to that. But I would say to you, why don't you try casting the spirit out first? All right? Amen. Try casting the spirit out. Amen. And see, if it becomes unruly, then you have authority, according to the scriptures in Romans 8, to call the ministers that attend upon civil discourse and order. That's called a law. The scripture is 911. Okay? And so. Yeah, I, you, know, you know, Chris is laughing, but let me tell you something, man. If a guy is about to come up upside your head with something. Uh, you know, it's, you can't put up with that. All right. Let me not, I'm not going to park there all day. All right. Anyway, verse 49, this is because I've never spoken on my own authority or of my own accord or as self-appointed. But the Father who sent me has himself given me orders concerning what to say and what to tell. And I know that his commandment is or means eternal life. So whatever I speak, I am saying exactly what my father has told me to say Amen. and in accordance with his instruction. So that's why I say let Jesus speak for himself in terms of what had happened. So Jesus spoke the words of his father when he did. 
it caused the faith of his father to come on the inside of him. Because, see, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Listen, faith is embedded in the word of God. That's, right. That's why if you dive in a swimming pool, you get wet. Because the nature of water is wet. There's no such thing as you getting in water and you don't get wet. And there's no such thing as you getting in the word and you don't get faith. Faith comes with the word like wet comes with water. All right? It's not about what you feel. It's not about what you think. It's about what you believe. And this is a spiritual truth that cannot be denied. Faith comes with the word of God as wet comes with water, my friend. And like dry comes with the desert. All right? All right. Praise the Lord. So anyway, so faith that is in God's word gets into your spirit when you speak it. Because see, when you speak it, this is why the Bible continually says, let not this word depart from out of your mouth. Because see, if you speak the word, and it's the word of God that you're speaking, faith is going to come. Hmm. Faith is going to come by hearing what? Hearing the word of God. Not the word of the devil, the word of God. Listen, I don't care who speaks it. If it's the word of God, faith is in it. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. If it's the word of God and it's spoken, faith is coming with it. That's why a lot of times, man, you know, just, just driving about the car and I'm listening to satellite radio. And listen, I don't care. Every, every message, I hear things. It may be different people speaking, different people presenting, different people preaching. That doesn't matter, man. I'm listening for the word. Yeah. Now, there's, there's commentary there. And sometimes a guy, a guy may throw out an opinion or two. But at least, thank God, they'll say, well, this is my opinion, you know. And I, I get that. I know how to eat hay and spit out sticks. Everybody know how to eat fish and spit out the bones? Right. Okay, so so that's the same thing. See, sometimes people can be saying, preachers can be preaching, teachers can be teaching, and, and something might go out there, you say, wait, wait a minute, that doesn't line up. Okay, ditch that, man. Get, get the nutrients. Get the nutrition. Amen? Praise the Lord. See, none of you can think, you can't think of going and getting a chicken sandwich without a bun. It's the bun you really don't need. Uh-oh. But, but, but you don't go up the window and say, give me a chicken patty. What, really? Okay. <laughs> now, here's the thing. You remember the illustration I gave you about the fish has gills to draw oxen out of the water. All right, well, see, here's the thing. Our born-again human spirit can draw faith from God's word like a fish can draw oxen out of sea water. I'm going to say that again. Our human spirit can draw faith from God's word into our hearts just like the gills of a fish can draw oxen out of sea water. All right? Amen. See, when Satan came against Jesus tempting him in the wilderness, Jesus responded by doing one thing, speaking only what his father said. Jesus said, it is written, and then he said what was written. And the devil couldn't handle it. The devil tempted him again. Jesus said, it is written again. And the devil tempted him for the third time. And the Lord said, it is written. I mean, it didn't say he, it didn't say he threw a hand grenade. It didn't say he dropped a smart bomb on the devil. <laughs> Technically, again, weaving what the word says and understanding what it says. Remember Ephesians 6, put on the whole armor of God. One of the armaments is what? The sword of the spirit. All Jesus did by saying it is written was cut the devil with the sword, which is the word of God. So when he said it is written, the sword went out. Come on, somebody. Amen. It's the greatest scalpel you can ever deploy in your life. Amen. So he just responded by it is written. So if you're going to get faith out of God's word, there has to first be faith in it. Amen. And I just told you there is. Faith is in God's word like wet is in water. Can you say amen? amen? If there was no faith in God's word, you couldn't get any faith out of God's word. Amen. But God's word is filled with faith. And that faith which is in God's word will get inside of you if you will speak it. Amen? amen? amen. 
Let me close with this, and this will be the end of this series. You have to learn how to write God's word on your heart. And God has given you the only instrument capable of writing on it. It's your tongue. The psalmist said, make my tongue as the pen of a ready writer. And I'm telling you right now, your tongue is the pen of a ready writer. It will inscribe in your spirit, man. It will inscribe on your heart whatever you use to write. Whatever you write with your tongue. Whatever you speak is essentially what's going to end up getting down on the inside of you. Can you say amen? Amen. Amen. Praise God. So you begin to understand why Satan launches all kinds of thoughts at your mind to get you to meditate on anything but the word. He knows that the more you confess what the word of God says will ultimately bring about conception of that word. And he's trying to administer it. This is deep. The devil tries to administer what I call a spiritual RU-46. Anybody know what RU-46 is? That's the abortion pill. If a woman takes an RU-46 pill, it's an instantaneous destruction of a pregnancy. They call it the abortion pill. It was, I guess the code name is RU-46. I don't know what the scientific names of all that stuff is, but RU-46 is an abortion pill. And that's what the devil tries to get you to take. Are you listening to me? By getting you to confess things that are not aligned with the word of God. All right. And, uh, you know, the, the idea is he's trying to get you to abort what the word of God is conceived in your heart. So, Essentially, the human spirit, or the heart of man, one and the same, is the spiritual womb of every child of God. Amen. I don't care what you have or what you don't have. Don't care where you are or where you're not. Okay? That's the awesomeness of what we're teaching here. Because I know it doesn't make sense that you say, if I just start changing what I say, this will change my life. This will change my circumstances. This will change my situation. First of all, I didn't say it. Jesus said it. Okay. I, I'm not here to split theological hairs. I'm not here to get into the, theological contests and conflicts. That's the reason why I take you to the word. And we look at the word and we read the word. And we say what the word says. And let it speak for itself. Every time you come here, I want to tell you, it's like a trough set up. And as the old expression goes, you can lead a horse to water. Can't make him drink. But I promise you, you get thirsty enough, you'll want to drink. You get hungry enough, you're going to want to eat. And I pray that you will exercise the power of the spoken word. Not every other day but every day of your life. Let's give God some praise in the house. Here. Thank God. The power of the spoken word. Thank you, Lord. Let's lift our hands in adoration and worship. Father, we thank you, Lord. We thank you for your loving kindness and your tender mercies, which are new every morning. For daily you load us with benefits. You sent your word and you healed us. We bless you, Lord. And all that is within us, we bless your holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all our iniquities, who heals all of our diseases, who redeems our life from destruction, who crowns us with loving kindness and tender mercy, who fills our mouths with good things, so that our youth is renewed like the eagle. Oh, thank you, Lord Jesus. We are more than conquerors through Jesus, who died for us and who loved us. We thank you, Lord, for perfect love casts out all fear. For as you are, according to your word, so are we in this world. Have your way, Lord. 
in our lives. Speak through our lips. Think through our minds. Reach through our hearts that we may fulfill the purpose for which you have created us. In Jesus' name. Praise the Lord. If you're tuned in to our live streaming broadcast today, we want to say thank you so much for joining us. We trust that the word of the Lord has been a source of inspiration, encouragement, blessing, and practical instruction for everyday living. God is faithful, that promise, my friend. Wherever you are, wherever you are. I like what a preacher used to say years ago that I admired greatly. He said, you don't have any trouble. All you need is faith in God. And I say to you, in addition to that, continue to feed your faith and starve your doubts to death. Be with us next time, and God richly bless you is our prayer. Amen. Let's give our live stream audience a good hand as we say goodbye to them. Praise the Lord. Amen, amen, and amen. Glory to God. I want you again, just lift your hand in thanksgiving. And I want you to open.